Now, if you're just tuning in, we're discussing the culture of superiority in Nigeria. Please let us hear what you have to say if you've experienced superiority, you know. And remember, you can join this conversation. Tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at Waysho Africa One with the hashtag Waysho or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-803-84663. So, Mr. Peter Okpatewa. I like what you are saying that we cannot be running away because these people, they are in excess supply. And it's true. They are in excess supply. But I just feel like, you know, sometimes when you know your worth, when you are empowered to know who you are, there are so many things you would not tolerate, right? Even if it is the norm and other people can take it, I wouldn't take it. That's how I see my own life. And because I am empowered. Now, so, this, um, so with this... Um, little analysis that be whatever explanation that I have given. In Nigeria today, right, the average man on the street, they do not understand who they are. They don't know the power that they possess. They don't know the rights they have, right? So um, we are not informed. You know, we are not empowered. If I, if I live abroad, even if I did not go to school, right, there are some things that I would do that I can survive, I can... I can I can leave, I can, I can survive, I can rent my home, I can pay my bills and all of that. Because the, the society, the environment is enabling enough to be able to know what, there will be different levels of people, but you are still comfortable. You're not begging on the streets. It's different in Nigeria. So where we have a society where the environment is not um, befitting or it's not soothing to be able to grow people at least to a level of, um, uh, what's it called, to a standard at least that they can take care of their basic needs. How do we even start to say, you know what, this isn't right and you question it? Because I feel that leadership, they have continuously kept us at this stage so they are not able to, so that we are not able to ask the right questions, you know, when they come every four years. And this is playing out and it is affecting the very fabric of who we are and there's no growth in sight. So how do we begin to correct this? All right. Um, in the course of, a, of your question, you raised very fundamental issues. I, I'll use the, the, the scenario, I mean, the example you, you cited, the Femi Fani Kayade scenario uh, to, to discuss this. Now, what's, what is ironical is that we often find or hear the older political war horses urge young stars to brace themselves, pull themselves by their bootstraps, and get ready to risk the arena of conflict in order to wear the crown of victory. Pull yourselves by your bootstraps. It was Martin Luther King who uttered the famous bond mo that it's a cruel jest to ask a bootless man to pull himself by his bootstraps. Mm. Boots have hardly ever been provided for Nigerian youths, young people. That's it. And when youths manage by dint of their own hard work to procure modest boots, the older ones try to deboot them. First, other people muffle them, muzzle them, and stifle their voices to the degree that many young people have simply be defined their own limitations and selected their chains. Then the older ones, the, 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 those who have entrenched themselves and as, ensconced as themselves atop the cornucopia of political conspiracy, like Byzantine emperors, remain there. My answer to your question is that it has to start from a transformation and a transmogrification of the political class. There has to be a complete reorientation. There has to be a change in our culture. The political class has to take the leadership, ensure that the culture of waste, the culture of flagrant abuse of power and what have you, are completely matters of the past. And we must begin to empower people. For example, a hungry man may not really care about what his rights are, like you mentioned, like you rightly mentioned. All he may want is his, is, 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 is his meal. And to use the words of the late American poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, he said, a crust of bread and a corner to sleep in. And what you find is that for most of these people, that's just all they look for. But at the end of the day, it's a pint of joy to a peck of trouble. A moment to smile, an hour to weeping, and then that is life for them. So it must start from a change in the political class. We have a very long way to go as a people. Okay, our so psyche, I... our ideals, our idea of what life is, is completely warped and lopsided. I just want to walk into this. There's a change in the political system to start with. 
Okay. When we have people who are in elective offices, people who fear God, people who do justly, people who love mercy, people who don't trample on the poor at will, and then we empower people to stand on their own, we begin to see some of these changes. Okay, so I'm just going to give a, do a follow-up to that. Now, if you listen when we were talking earlier, she said that the political class is happy to keep us where we are, so they continue to do what they're doing. Now, if we have to depend on the political class to change when they do not want to change, what hope is there? Can't this change come from the people? Can't we come from Butterum? Won't there be a revolution? Because we will keep being hungry. We will keep, uh, our rights will keep being denied if we wait for a people that do not want to change. So don't you see any future in the change coming from the people? I can assure you very pointedly that Nigerians will not revolt. Hmm. I have found that it is not part of our, it is not part of our makeup for people to revolt in this country. Everybody loves his corner. Everybody wants to keep quiet. We all follow in uniform mediocrity. But clearly, regardless of what the situation currently is, the answer certainly will be in some kind of, you know, some kind of push by the young people. It may not be in the fiscal revolution of carrying sticks and stones and what have you. We must continue to engage, regardless of all attempts made to muzzle us, to to stifle the voice of, of younger people, of those who are not in the political class, we must continue to engage and quit spending our time in frivolities. Mm. The problem with younger Nigerians is that we're giving to so much frivolities, so much trifling things. We like to jest, we enjoy all manner of things that don't add value. If we continue to push, we continue to ask questions, we continue to, in a sense, uh, put our government and our officials to account for what they're doing. And before you know what's happening, gradually we'll begin to see the change that we're seeking. And another thing I must ask, add quickly is that younger people, those who are not in the political space, claim that they want change, but they are not even exemplifying those change to start with. If you must see change, you must be the change that you desire for the change to come. In our little space, in our communities, how do we treat our neighbors? Don't we show cues? Don't we, don't we seek gratification? Hmm. It's pervasive. It's in the society. Clearly, we have a long way to go, but like you said, it has to start somewhere. And those who are not in the political class must continue to push, must continue to lead by examples in their own enclaves, in their own societies, in their own neighborhoods and communities, and what have you. Gradually, we begin to see the change that we all desire. So I'll come to Sansi. Let me just quickly read um, a comment from... Our viewer, he says, I believe your title can also be the culture of oppressive superiority. Hmm. <laughs> well, so go ahead, Sanzi. I actually like that. The yes, culture, the culture of, of, of oppressive, oppressive, oppressive superiority. superiority. That is brilliant. Who is the person? The person well put Nemo. Yeah. <laughs> that is so apt. Yeah. Well done. Okay, so you talked about changes coming from uh, people at the top, poli uh, politicians and people in leadership. I agree, that is a valid view. We need, like I mentioned earlier, we need people with refined character in political positions who genuinely care. However, we should also uh, remember that these people come from families. And in a situation where we are raised in families where um, you say don't, your don't father is uh, 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 provides everything and you don't question your father. Your father says jump up and it's not okay to ask your father. But I don't see why I should jump up could you explain further? It's like, are, are, you, are you disrespecting me or, or something? So my, my argument is that I think a lot, and I think AK mentioned it earlier, that um, a lot of these changes has to come from us raising liberal kids, not liberal as in you can misbehave. Yes, we discipline our children, but we should give them room to ask questions. We should think give them room, them. yeah, to express their intelligence. And yes, the society, we need to learn to value um, in intellectuals as well. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. So, so quickly, um, what would you say, Peter, to um, our educational structure? Mm -hmm. How has this played out in terms of um, uh, continuous fueling of this superiority mindset? mindset yes. yes. How do you think our educational structure has, you know, has contributed? First of all, our educational system is in complete chaos. Hmm. If, we, if we were to start to remedy 
the rot in that in that sector i'm sure uh, we we would be doing a lot of work on that for a long time to come and we we have a system where many people in that in the educational sector first of all don't even give the students the right to have a voice to speak so you can't challenge your your lecturer you can't present a more rigorous or a superior intellectual argument they, they, they see it as a challenge to their own stance so there must be some a model for liberal discourse where we we tolerate each other even in school so you, you, you should find a lecturer who is willing to open himself or herself to knowledge from the students. So nobody should assume any form of superiority intellectually over another. We must realize that we are all ignorant only in different subjects. So if you present your argument to someone, whether you're a lecturer or not, and then the student presents a superior argument, you should embrace it with all profound gratitude. That's where it must start from. Like you mentioned, charity begins at home. These ideals, these values must begin from the very foundation, mm. from the schools, from the secondary schools, from the universities. We must teach people that they have freedom of speech and freedom so after speech. Can we put this speech. as a law? Together. Peter, Absolutely. Mr. Peter, and can we, we put this as a law? encourage people to become... So, so can we put this as, as a law that in classrooms going forward, that is true because I've seen situations where, you know, I, I remember many years ago, my son wrote something in, in class and the answer was actually right. But because that was not the answer, the teacher knew. I said even the, the person that originated that question would be glad to meet that so somebody could actually find. So can we put this as a rule, maybe in schools, as a lawyer, is it possible to be able to put this in our, in our laws, you know, to say, you know, we're going forward in our educational structure, students must be allowed to think outside of the box that some of these teachers have placed us because that is the only way teachers will comply. You know, this garbage in, garbage out. We can't go for we can't go forward with this. Yeah, well, I was thinking, I was thinking once the curriculum change, it would address that. So they would align. for me, it's to change the curriculum to the kind of people that you want to raise. And remember, I said that it's a colonial system. Uh. The, the curriculum is a colonial system. So if you need to change that, you need to you see why people are embracing the British curriculum yeah. to teach their schools. It's not because they feel superior, because that's the kind of children that they want to raise. So for me, I think a change in curriculum will do it. Okay, but so let's what do you what agree? To want to <laughs> well, yeah, for me, you know, these, these matters are profoundly subjective. So it may be difficult to legislate such subjective mm. matters. That students should have a right to speak. It may be difficult. There are laws. Our problem as a nation is not a paucity of laws. It's not that we don't have enough laws to guide some of these things. It's only that the laws are more obeyed in the breach. If you go into the archives, you will find a plethora of laws on on education. So what we just need, we need an overhaul of the academic system, the educational mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. and we also need those agencies that have supervisory oversight mm. over these institutions to indeed begin to do their job. Okay, what so we okay. find in tertiary institutions today is a massive, massive joke. Mm. We can, and, and the problem, I, I must tell you this pointedly, the problem most times is that we are just a copy and paste society. Yeah, We're a copy and paste no. nation. We just go to the UK and just dub. It doesn't matter. Whether what is we working for them is working for them. Look at the, the, the pandemic. Look at what happened. We just monitor what is America doing, what is Britain doing, and we just copy and paste. We don't regardless of our own idiosyncrasies, mm -hmm. regardless mm -hmm. of our own peculiar circumstances. We must become the people who are intellectually independent. We must believe right. in our capacity to legislate, to do our own things. We must be untouched on us. Things that work for us as a people. Absolutely. Not okay. going all so, globe trotting uh, and looking sorry, for what every other person is doing. Let me ask you a quick uh, question now, um, and I would really appreciate like a really quick answer because I think we're running out of time. So in this situation where you have the um, the journalist and FFK, so I know he has apologized, but is it after possible being, after being forced to right he came and then and going through all that going embarrassment the journalist yeah. going through all that embarrassment so the journalist if he wanted could he have sued uh femi uh, uh of course fanny coyote and if he did what are the chances of him coming out winning the case because everybody knew ffk was in the wrong well everybody assessed his lawyers <laughs> first of so all I, first, first of all i don't want to give a pro bono advice to the journalist 
<laughs> that just based. And again, well, if you see the, the, the whole drama, FFK said he was stupid. I mean, that's, uh, uh, that, that was for me completely unwarranted because the question he, the journalist asked was patently innocuous and in the line of his duty. You ask him if he can sue him, FFK did allege or infer that the journalists collect brown envelopes. And in this country, we know what brown envelopes have come to so settledly imply. Well, he may want to put him to the to 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 to, to confirm or to prove that he indeed collects uh, envelopes. And it's quite sad that in spite of all the public outcry, the principal actor in that shameful outing has refused to tender an unreserved apology. No, he has actually. That, well, that, that's what we find. That's, that's just, it's just, it, it just typifies what we find in, in the larger political class. Well, I, I, I think that, <laughs> that's all we can take. We really ran out of time. Yeah. But thank you so much, Peter Kwatawa, for joining you. us. We really, really had fun with you. Um, we hope, we hope oh. that we'll be able to go move past this um this culture because it's actually affecting the very fabric of our existence as a as a nation thank you so much thank you for having me so quickly ladies in one minute each what do you think sanzi i i think we need to kill pride because it's not just about power i've seen some powerful privileged people who are humble so a mm. couple of them believe have this belief that the higher you go the more humble you should become so we just need more people with refined character who hmm. care about humility others. takes grace my dear it, <laughs> how about you ak do i have hope that yeah. we will address and and demand more accountability from our leaders yes do i have hope that people are waking up yes if the youth will know the power that we have and use it. Mm -hmm. If we want to live on social media, use it as your tool. It's not the problem. Whatever, if you want to be intellectual, use it. Whatever form or whatever angle, whatever space you find yourself, use it and have a voice. Mm -hmm. And have that voice in the right way so you begin mm -hmm. to build integrity mm -hmm. and, and, you know, stump up this. So I also right. am asking, appealing to our government, em empower people economically. When you are empowered economically, you have clarity to be able to ask the right questions. I know they might not want to do it because it's favoring them, but that is the solution I think would help change a lot of things. So thank you so much for watching, guys. Please watch a repeat broadcast of this episode tomorrow at 3 p.m. It's been a very insightful conversation. Please keep all the conversations going on all our social media platforms at Wish Your Africa One or at Plus TV Africa as we continue to hear what you're saying now in case you missed today's quote here it is again don't allow someone who talks to you in a snobby condescending rude manner get to you or intimidate you this is a sign of an insecure person trying to appear superior to you arrogance and condescension is always a sign of weakness is a sign of weakness. We'll see you live tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Thank you, ladies. Yeah, bye. <laughs> bye.